All right. Hi, everyone. So today we are going to be talking about gases. We're, we're starting a new unit today, which is very exciting, our gas laws unit. So first and foremost, we know that a lot of gases are invisible, right? Um, if you look around you, air is a gas, our air particles, um, and we can't see anything. So the question is, are all gases matter, especially if we can't see them? Um, well, before we answer this, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is matter? And matter is just mass. So um, if there are atoms present, then yes, there is matter. So because gases are made of atoms and molecules, which have mass, that means that yes, gases take up space and have mass, and therefore gases are matter. We can think of balloons here, right? Um, balloons can be filled with helium or other gases, and that is obviously taking up space. So yes, gases are matter. Now, um, speaking of air, the major components of the air that we breathe is actually, it's actually mostly nitrogen, which is very interesting because of course we use oxygen when we breathe um, and most of the air is not actually oxygen, which is just interesting. Um, of course, when growing up, I feel like we all think that uh, all of the air that we breathe is oxygen, but if we were to breathe, you know, just 100% oxygen, it's actually not very good for us. Um, so you can see that 78% uh, of the air that we breathe is nitrogen, 20, about 21% is oxygen, um, almost a percent is argon, and then of course there's carbon dioxide and then other gases present in the air that we breathe as well. Um, next question is, are gases flammable? Well, not all gases. Obviously, if I lit a match in this room, it's not going to just like explode into flame. But then, of course, we do have gases that are flammable. So some are, such as hydrogen and methane, um, and some are not. Oxygen gas itself is not actually flammable. Um, this video right here, I'm going to mute it and just play you a little clip of it. Um, but I'll put these notes online so you can watch the whole thing if you want to, because of course it's Mythbusters, it's very entertaining. So what's happening here is they are creating a um, column of methane bubbles. So he fills a um, big bucket with soapy water and then puts a tube in there that's putting methane gas into there. And because methane is lighter than air, that column of bubbles is actually going to kind of float in the air um, and float upwards because, again, it's lighter than air. So um, he has his column of methane bubbles and then he's going to set it on fire, which of course is the best part. So because methane is flammable, it catches on fire, All right? Again, this will be on canvas if you guys want to watch it. <laughs> Um, now, like we said before, the air that we breathe is a gas. It is obviously not visible, right? It's transparent. We can't see anything. Um, however, not all gases are invisible. So some of them are visible. Something like um, iodine gas, which is right here. That's purple. Um, chlorine gas is green. It's very poisonous. It's this one right here. Um, bromine gas is orange, which is this one right here. And then we have our nitrogen dioxide that is brown. And that's this one right here. And the main takeaway here is that if a gas is visible, it is poisonous. Um, this chlorine gas has been used in warfare and things like that. Very dangerous, very poisonous. Um, another question is, do gases weigh the same amount? And the answer to this is no, it really depends on the molar mass. Um, and of course, we talked all about molar mass in our moles unit. Um, if we watch this video right here, what's happening is that they actually are filling this container here with sulfur hexafluoride, which is heavier than air. So it's invisible obviously, um, but they have a little aluminum foil boat, which is going to float on that gas because again, it's heavier than air. So um, it looks like magic, but it's not. <laughs> it's just because that silver hexafluoride is heavier. And then he's actually scooping it up and pouring it into the aluminum boat, which is kind of fun. Pretty cool. <clears throat> 
Now, next question, how do gases move? Well, gases are going to move by diffusion, um, which basically is just moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Meaning if I put um, a bunch of gas into one side of this container and there's a lot of gas over here, but not much over here, it's just going to diffuse over to the lower um, concentration, concentration side until it's just evenly dispersed. Next question, do all gases move at the same speed? No, heavier gases are going to move slower than lighter gases. And this makes sense, right? If something's heavier, it's going to be harder to move. So therefore it will move slower. Um, and we actually get an equation for this. It's called Graham's law. And this is gonna relate the speed of gases to their molar mass. So the equation looks like this. We get R1 over R2 equals the square root of M2 over M1. And R here is the rate of effusion, and then M is the molar mass. And you'll have a question or two on your homework assignment that uses this equation, but I'm not going to go over an example in this specific uh, lecture. Um, here's an example of our diffusion of gases, so the movement of gases and the rate of effusion and things like that. Um, so what, what's happening here is that we are going to put, or the guy in this video, not us exactly, but he's answering this question right here. And what he's going to do is he's going to put um, two different substances on either side of this tube. So on this right-hand side, he's putting... Um, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. That's what's soaked with the uh, in the cotton ball right here. And then on the left side right here, he has, he's going to put a cotton ball soaked with ammonia or NH3. So we have HCl on this uh, right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we have NH3. And if you look at the periodic table, um, our HCl, right, hydrogen is just one gram per mole. And then chlorine is a about 35 grams per mole. So this um, molar mass over here is about 36 grams per mole. Our NH3 or ammonia, um, nitrogen is about 14 grams per mole. And then hydrogen again is one gram per mole. So 14 plus three, that is 17. So we have a lighter molar mass over on this left hand side. So because of that, that side is going to move more quickly so therefore it will move a greater distance so you can see this little ring right here we get our um, ammonium chloride ring of gas that's forming right here and it's closer to the hydrogen chloride or the hydrochloric acid soap side because um, our ammonia is much smaller so it moves quickly more quickly and therefore it moves a greater distance Again, if you want to watch this video, and he, he explains this as well, um, so this video will be posted on the lecture slides on Canvas. So next question, do gases react? Well, you just saw a reaction happening between two gases, so the answer to that is yes. Um, but however, not all of them do. So some do, yes, but not all of them because we know that the noble gases, which are on that far right-hand side of the periodic table, they actually do not react because they have that full octet. They're very stable. They don't want to react with anyone else. Um, and I thought this little graphic was cute because they're very noble. They don't want to react with anyone else because they're noble gases. All right, so before we talk about the variables um, in our gas laws equations, we have to talk a little bit about kinetic molecular theory. Now, kinetic molecular theory is going to kind of explain how gas particles move and interact and all that good stuff. Um, so this is going to be explain the behavior of gases under certain conditions. Um, so the first part of kinetic molecular theory is that gases are made of tiny particles that travel in straight lines. And then the second part is that molecules themselves do not occupy volume. So these little molecules and particles of gas are so incredibly small that they are not the thing that is making the volume of gas that we have. All right. It's going to be like the motion of the gases, which again, we will talk about. Um, so the volume is determined by the container that the gas is in if it's flexible, how big it is, things like that. Um, the space between the particles in a gas is so great that the volume of the particles themselves is negligible. 
The third part here is that the collisions between molecules are perfectly elastic. And what this means is that um, not only is our momentum conserved, but also the kinetic energy is also conserved. Um, and that is very physics uh, concept. And so if you take my physics class in the future, we will talk more about uh, elastic collisions versus inelastic collisions. But what this means is that they just bounce off one another. Again, bounce off one another and the sides of the container. That's what an elastic collision is. And no energy is lost when the molecules collide. <clears throat> and then finally, the fourth part of kinetic molecular theory is that there are no attractive or repulsive forces between the particles. They're just kind of flying all over the place. So um, the first variable we're going to talk about is temperature. Now we represent temperature in our gas laws equations by a capital T. Um, and the definition here we know in chemistry, we define temperature as a measure, measure of kinetic energy. So the higher the temperature, the faster those particles are moving, right? The higher the kinetic energy of the particles. So remember kinetic energy, like I said, is the energy of movement. So the speed of the gas particles determines the temperature. Again, the faster they're moving, the higher the temperature. Higher temperature, how many times can I say this? Higher temperature, fast moving particles, lower temperature, slower moving particles. Now the units for temperature we know are degrees Celsius and Kelvin. That's Those are the two units that we use in chemistry. Of course, in the United States, we also used to, like to use degrees Fahrenheit, um, but that is not a good unit to use in chemistry. Um, most of the time in these problems, we will be using Kelvin. All right, so remember how to convert between those two. Um, if you don't remember, Kelvin is going to be your degree Celsius plus 273, whereas degree Celsius will be um, Kelvin minus 273. Now our standard temperature, um, we'll use something called STP, which means standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So here, I don't know why this one came up later, <laughs> but um, a lot of the time we will draw these little diagrams, which basically shows the temperature of the gas. So this gas right here, because these lines are longer, that means that they're moving, those particles are moving faster. Okay, so the lines here are basically the velocity of the particles. So the longer the line or the arrow, the vector, really what it is, um, the longer the vector, the, the higher the velocity, the greater the kinetic energy, the higher the temperature. The shorter the line, the slower the velocity, the lower the kinetic energy, the lower the temperature. All right, so the next uh, variable we're gonna talk about is volume. Um, volume is represented by a capital V in our equations. The definition of this is the amount of space an object occupies. So um, in the case of a gas, the size of the container is going to determine the volume of the gas. And especially if this is a rigid container, um, meaning the sides are not like movable. If we have something like a balloon, that's not a rigid container, right? It can get bigger or smaller um, depending on how much gas is in there. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, but if this is a rigid container, like, I don't know, like a Tupperware or something like that, um, then that rigid container is going to define the volume of that gas. The units for volume um, are milliliters, liters, we could also use centimeters cubed, meters cubed, things like that. Um, here's some conversions. We have one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter and then 1,000 milliliters is equal to one liter. So you can use those with um, conversions if we need to. Um, now Avogadro's law for volume states that the number of particles making up a sample of a gas is proportional to the volume of that gas under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. So if you have the same temperature and pressure in two different samples of gas and one is larger, that means that the larger one will have more particles than the smaller one. So this is <laughs> exactly what I just said. Um, here I have a larger volume and a smaller volume, just a little graphic of volume itself. Um, all right, our next variable is number of particles. I'm just moving myself all around the screen. I hope that's entertaining for you. Um, so we have number of particles next. Now number of particles is represented by a lowercase n 
in equations, and this is the number of particles in the gas. Um, then, now the units for this is going to be moles or atoms or molecules. So um, we need to pay attention to our other units in the equation in order to figure out what exactly we're using for this as well. Um, so for example, moles of oxygen, atoms of argon, molecules of carbon dioxide, those are our examples of R, N in our equations. Um, so here we can see that in this sample right here, I have a lower number of particles than I do in this sample right here. Um, we can see some of our variables interacting already. Uh, we have two of the same volume, V1 equals V2, because again, they are the same size container, so therefore the same volume. And then because we have a higher number of particles down here, our pressure is going to be higher. And I'll talk about pressure next, actually, um, at a constant temperature and a constant volume. So we can see that these, these, all these variables that we're talking about are going to be interacting um, and kind of influencing one another. And we will talk about those when we talk about our actual gas laws equations. All right, so the next variable, like I said, we're gonna talk about is pressure. And pressure is represented by a capital P in equations. The definition of pressure is the force of gas particles hitting the sides of the container. So the more frequently that particles hit the sides of the container, the higher the pressure. So in that last example on the last slide, because there were more particles, those particles were hitting the sides of the container at a, more, at a, at a higher rate, and therefore the pressure is going to be higher. Now there is an equation for pressure, it's force per unit area, so we can see that when we have a, um, a lot of force, there's a lot of pressure, or if we have a smaller area, there's also a lot of pressure, because area is on the denominator here. Now we have a couple tools to measure pressure. One of them is called a manometer. <laughs> I always have a hard time saying that, I don't know why. Um, and what this does is it compares the pressure of a gas sample to the atmospheric pressure. The reason I moved myself is I have a picture of it coming up soon over here. Um, so what happens here is that we get the pressure of the gas will be the atmospheric pressure plus the height. And this will make more sense when you actually see the picture. The other tool to measure pressure is called a barometer. And you've probably um, heard of or seen one of these before because that is kind of a little bit more common. Um, but what happens with a barometer is that air particles push mercury into a tube. It's this one right here. So our air particles push the mercury down and the mercury goes up this tube. And then the height of that mercury mercury is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. So if you've ever heard of millimeters of mercury, that's one of our units of pressure, which again, I'll talk about next. Um, but that this is why, because there are the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters, because it's 760 millimeters tall of mercury. So that's where that unit comes from. This right here is our manometer. Um, this is our gas inside of here. So here we have the pressure of the gas. It's going to push this liquid um, down here. And then so that difference right here will we use in this actual uh, equation right here. So the pressure of the gas, which is what you're finding usually, will be the atmospheric pressure, which of course this is open to the atmosphere. So whatever our atmospheric pressure is, plus the height of that liquid in this device. All right, so units of pressure, um, one atmosphere or ATM, that is going to be our pressure at sea level. And then we also have a unit called a kilopascal, um, and one atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. Um, like I said, we have that millimeters of mercury unit as well. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, that unit comes from that barometer or barometric pressure. And then in the United States, we like to use pounds per square inch. Um, so one atmosphere is equal to 14.6 pounds per square inch. Again, you can see that unit pounds, that little slashy, is called, this like per, and then inches squared. So that's where that pounds per square inch comes from. There's also tors. So 760 tors is equal to one atmosphere. Um, and so those are all our units for pressure. Most of the time in our calculations, we use atmospheres. Sometimes we do use millimeters of mercury as well. So those are probably the two that are most used. And then we will sometimes use kilopascals and tors. 
we will not use this in our calculations again because it's used to measure tire pressure in the United States, not in chemistry calculations. <laughs> so that is a little bit of background about the different uh, variables we'll be using in our gas laws equations and just gases in general. You do have an assignment on Canvas about intro to gases. So good luck on that and I will see you all in class.